Welcome back, y'all. In this video, I'm going to be making diethyl succinyl succinate from diethyl succinate and sodium ethoxide. I'm just going to call it DESS, D E S S, from now on, just because it's easier. There are two reactions happening first, a Clayson condensation, and then a rapid cyclization reaction, both of which are base induced. I didn't go into this synthesis with the intent of covering the Clayson condensation but I might as well talk a little bit about it. It was discovered by the German chemist Rainer Ludwig Clayson in 1887, originally between ethyl benzoate and acetone or acetophenone. This is the same Clayson of the Clayson-Schmidt condensation, the Clayson reaction, the Clayson rearrangement, the Clayson isatin synthesis, the Clayson flask, and the Clayson adapter. Yes, the name reactions have similar names. Yes, they're all different. And yes, it can be confusing. DES is mainly used as a precursor to quinacridone pigments, and that's exactly why I'm making it. The synthesis is straightforward, requiring only diethyl succinate, anhydrous ethanol, sodium metal, and sulfuric acid, so let's get right into it. Firstly, I'm packing a drying tube with a mixture of soda lime and anhydrous calcium chloride to protect the mixture from water and CO2, as sodium ethoxide is very sensitive to both of them. Once it's packed, I move on to weighing out the sodium metal. It's stored under mineral oil, sorry Diddy, and while it wouldn't be detrimental to the reaction, it's good lab practice to remove what adheres to the pieces of metal by washing them with either ether or hexanes and patting dry with paper towels to weigh it out accurately. Sodium is a very non-dense metal, it's very light, at 0.968 grams per milliliter, so weighing out a little over 30 grams of it takes a while and was a pain in the ass, so I thought I'd include the footage. I didn't know if I wanted to do quarter or third scale of the procedure I'm using, which is why I have two lists of the same reactants, but I ended up doing one third scale. An oil bath is used instead of a heating mantle to prevent charring at a later point in the reaction. I prefer vegetable oil over mineral oil because it's cheaper and has a lower flash point, and mineral oil, at least mine, smokes starting at like 150 degrees, which is annoying. Silicone oil is also another good one, but vegetable oil is like 5 bucks a gallon. It's a lot easier to get and replace. I also use my super nice special ethanol with no denaturants. Once the ethanol is added, I get the condenser and everything else set up, and then I start adding the sodium. Kind of like with nitric acid, but for a different reason. Sodium is easier to handle with bare hands, because if it gets on your glove and you don't know about it, and it starts spontaneously reacting and heating up, it could start a sodium fire on your glove and melt to your hand, which is uh, not great. I definitely could have added it faster, because it's just said to add it as fast as possible without it getting out of hand, but I was playing it safe. Once it's all added, I reflux the mixture until all the sodium dissolves, which takes a little over an hour. The original procedure took like three or four hours because they did it on like three times the scale. Then I weigh out the diethyl succinate and add it gradually at first, then by dumping the rest in. The procedure says to add it all at once, then right after that, in parentheses, caution, exothermic reaction, which seems incongruous, but I realize now that it's really not that exothermic, so I could have added it all at once, but again, I was playing it safe. After adding the diester, a thick precipitate forms, so there's no way magnetic stirring could be used. Then I reflux the mixture for 24 hours straight. A few times I lifted the flask out of the bath and shook it a bit, but I don't think it was necessary. It was more for a false sense of security. Once the 24 hours was up, I swapped the reflux condenser to a simple distillation apparatus and distilled off as much ethanol as would come over. Using a heating mantle for this step would overheat the residue and char it as more ethanol is distilled, hence the oil bath. The residue looks kind of like Jupiter, which I think is pretty cool but now I'm about to destroy it. 
The next step is to add 6.6666666 milliliters of one molar sulfuric acid to it and stir vigorously for at least three or four hours, but they kind of recommend overnight, which is what I did. And I switched the stir bar. After that, I filtered the mixture and washed the precipitate a few times with distilled water. After air drying to a constant weight, I ended up with 67.2 grams of crude product, and yes, I subtracted the weight of the filter paper. I could have removed the filter paper from the dried powder before recrystallizing it, but I'm about to filter it while it's hot, so it's unnecessary. I'm using 500 milliliters of ethyl acetate for the recrystallization, but I do end up using a little more to rinse out beakers and other dishes and to wash the filter. Ethyl acetate has some annoying surface tension, so I spilled some, hence the uh, dish on the right, to catch that. My phone died while I was recording this, but it was just more of the same thing, so hopefully y'all don't mind. Once the filtration and washing steps were done, and my phone was recharged enough, I'm stirring the filtered mixture and heating it back to boiling so that once the excess ethyl acetate boils off and the solution cools down, the crystallization is as uniform as possible. Once it's at about room temperature, I put the beaker in the freezer overnight, then filter it. I boil the filtrate down to one-tenth of its volume to get a second, less pure crop of crystals. Here are all the uncorrected melting points. I'm not sure why they're higher than the literature values, especially since they're supposed to be cream or cream pink colored, rather than the light brown that mine are. Could be that they're uncorrected, but usually colored impurities lower, or impurities in general, lower the melting point of a sample. Oh well. In total, I end up with 63 grams of DES, which is, counting and not counting the 2 grams, 71.4 to 73.8% yield. Higher than that reported in the procedure, which is 64 to 68%. I'm very happy with this yield, even though the end product doesn't have exactly the same characteristics as that described in literature. And I could do a second recrystallization, adding activated carbon to it and filtering it hot, again, to remove the remaining colored impurities, but because the melting point is what it is, I didn't think it was all that necessary. If, after using it in the next synthesis for quinacridone, the yield is terrible or something else goes horribly wrong that can't be anything other than the deaths, I will recrystallize it and do that, and of course I'll include that in the video. And that's about all I've got. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, like, comment, and or subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. It helps me out, and I will see you in the next video.